Happy Sabbath. I'm Shelley Quinn. I'm J.D. Quinn. And we are so glad you're joining us for this family worship. We will be doing part three mm -hmm. of Grief the Way Out. We didn't intend for it to be three parts, but it's turned out well this way, I think. And what we will be focusing on tonight is comforting those who grieve. Mm. What's the right way to go about it? I'll tell you what, there's a lot of people who do it the wrong way and inflict more harm. So what we will do is look through the scriptures and we're going to have a wonderful time tonight in the Lord. Yes, I was just once again, I want to say happy Sabbath to each one of you. And of course, happy Sabbath to our friends here. We have Darrell and Sasha down here at the end of the table from us. Just love y'all. Love, Love you, you too. too. No. <laughs> uh, if you were looking to, to have a good day, bump into these two right here because they always have those <laughs> big <Lord>. smiles. You <laughs> know? And then we have our good friend Terry over here, Terry Stanley. Happy Sabbath. She's always happy got a big Sabbath. smile also. Happy Sabbath. I'm happy, happy to be Sabbath. here. Amen. Well, we're glad you're yeah. here. And we're missing Ian and uh, Angela, Angela Vandebach, who have been with us for the first two. But they are speaking at a camp meeting right now, and they're not with us. So Amen. what we'd like to do is, honey, you want to say a prayer before we get oh, started? Oh, certainly. Father, we thank you, Lord, that we can come to you in the name of Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that, uh, that you're amidst us. We invite the Holy Spirit in to be our guide, to be our comforter. And we just ask, Lord, as the right words come out of our mouth, to, to maybe touch someone's heart, that they know that it's coming from you. We love you and we thank you. In the name of Jesus, amen. 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 Well, we're excited because we have people on the set with us who know a little something about this. We'll be sharing some personal stories as well. But I wanted to just kind of give you a recap of the first two programs. We have defined human grief as a God-given emotion of deep sorrow, pain that results from life altering loss or identity altering circumstances. And grief is a two-sided coin. There's an external expression and an internal. The internal sorrow, if somebody is internalized, I mean, it's always internal is where it's coming from. But if someone doesn't know how to walk through grief, they can end up getting swallowed by their circumstances if they have no hope. But the external is the mourning, the lamenting, the, the expression of their sorrow that we see. And we don't always understand what's going on on the inside. So far, what we've looked at is types of grief, biblical examples of grief, symptoms of grief, we looked at how God understands grief because Jesus was a man mm. of sorrows, mm. how God comforts us through prayer, through his presence, through the leading of the Holy Spirit, just by his love, through the support of fellow believers, and also just through the beauty of nature and how he renews our hope and our strength as we look to the blessed hope of his second coming and just the idea of the promise of salvation. And when I said, we didn't cover these, we hit on them. Is that a good way to say it? Because mm -hmm. we're not trying to put ourselves forward as professional grief mm -hmm. counselors. We're looking at what the Bible says and, and how we all personally can relate. So we're going to talk about supporting those who grieve. Mm. Grief is an inevitable part of the human experience. If you haven't experienced grief in your life, just wait, it's coming. That's something it, it encompasses all kinds of emotions. When I think about the emotions of grief, sadness, obviously, mm. anger. We had a friend when her husband died, she was angry at him for a year because he knew he was having some problems, but he never went to the doctor to have his heart checked. Mm -hmm. um, guilt, some people, let's say a child commits suicide 
and they grieve with this guilt. If only I had intervened, if only, if only, if only. I had a neighbor who, as a young woman, had put her baby in bed with her to nurse her baby, fell asleep, mm. and rolled over and smothered her baby. Mm. And she ended up actually having a nervous breakdown and being institutionalized for a while. She had a really difficult time getting beyond the guilt of grief. Uh, and then, of course, just despair. What we will focus on tonight is just primarily three things that are at least, I'm just categorizing it into three um, attributes of being a good support to someone who's grieving. First, empathy. We've got to learn to empathize. Mm. Second is validation. We've got to let people know their feelings are valid. And then thirdly is just support in practical ways. So Sasha, would you read Romans 12, 15? Let's see if God intends us to support those who grieve. Sure. It says, rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that weep. So what does that say to you? Um, just be there for people. I mean, for me, it's nothing like having somebody to be there to support. And, and this is, shows me you don't always have to say words. Mm -hmm. Just be there with your presence. Let people know that you're happy for them if something good happens. And maybe you may shed a tear with them when something tragic happens. Amen. And they can feel that support through that. Amen. I think the main thing is, is just to be available. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just say, you know, my heart goes out to you or whatever. And, you know, if you need some help or assistance, just let me know. Mm -hmm. Shelly yeah. and I'd love to be able to mm -hmm. try to, just to do the best that we can do. Mm -hmm. I mean, not, uh, and I not always things we can do. How about Terry, would you read? So, so the first, these are kind of two scriptures on empathy. Mourn with those who mourn. Show empathy for them. Uh, Colossians 3.12. Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering. So, so, and let, we're going to, I'm going to kind of break these words down because what, what version were you reading from? This is the New King James. The New King James. And if you look in the NIV, it says, clothe yourself with compassion, mm -hmm. uh, kindness, humility, and gentleness and patience. So it's saying the same thing, a little bit different wording. But this is how we empathize. You've got something to say, it looks like. Uh, well, I know that you mentioned the word compassion and you always look at when Jesus, it says that Jesus was moved with compassion for the mm -hmm. multitudes. Yes. And when you mentioned about, um, it, it's, it's almost like Jesus wore that compassion wherever Amen. he went. And it, was a, it was a garment that he never took off. Amen. And so we too have to wear that garment, the righteousness of Christ. And wherever we go, no matter what we face, um, we can have something that we can share with somebody to bring them um, comfort. And there was something that you had mentioned earlier, um, both yourself and JD, about um, being there for somebody in reference to the text that Sasha mentioned. And I think sometimes we freeze up because I know I have, like you know someone is going through something very serious um, and the grief is real, uh, it's written all over their face and you don't have the words to say to them. But um, I think instead of freezing up and doing nothing, for the person, I think sometimes it's as simple as what Sasha said, just be there for the person. Um, it's, it reminds me of the situation where <laughs> with, with my wife or wives in general, sometimes they just want you to listen. Wait, did you have wives in general? Or? <laughs> <laughs> okay, with your wife and others' wives. Yes, oh, okay. yes. But um, sometimes I realize as the years have gone by, she doesn't want me to say anything she wants to, she, if she wants to talk or something like that, or she just wants me to be there and listen. Mm -hmm. And I've learned um, that I was, to fix it. <laughs> <laughs> I was a better service to her when I would just listen rather than, oh, I got a solution for that. Because in some situations, especially when it comes to grief, 
you don't have a solution uh, yeah. that you can present to them, um, except for what's in God's words, displaying that compassion and being there for that person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I love what you said because it's so true. Many of us, let's, let's face it, when someone is going through just the worst time of their life and they're walking in the valley of the shadow of death, it's intimidating mm -hmm. to, you know, we feel like we're uncomfortable with what do we say. Mm -hmm. And then I have to say this, there are some people that are compassion fatigued. Have you heard that? Mm. You know, we're, we look at the news and there's one bad thing after another, or we're going through things and everybody else is going through things. And sometimes people do freeze up. And I think what we've got to do is be super careful about what we say. Mm -hmm. Let's, you know, I'm thinking when you're talking about being there, thinking of the story of Job. Oh, yeah. When Job's friends showed up seven days, seven nights, what'd they do? They listened. <laughs> they were there for him. They were comforters. They didn't say anything. Guess what happened? <laughs> they began to tell him, you've brought this on yourself. <laughs> you must have done something wrong, big boy. And now they begin to pontificate on the scripture, trying to make sure he's got everything right. Sometimes people do that. And they were miserable comforters. They brought him no comfort whatsoever. So, Darrell, would you read Proverbs 25, 11? Because you're going to see how this fits in here. Proverbs 25, 11. Sure. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. Mm. Yes. And to Isn't me, that a beautiful, I mean, yeah. how poetic, <laughs> apples of gold in settings of silver. And so to me, it represents uh, words that have a beauty to them, mm. uh, that when they're spoken, it does more for the person than sometimes uh, you can imagine. It, 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 it taps into their heart where many times there's, a, there's pain, there's brokenness, um, and it sifts through all of that and it comes to a place that helps them to receive comfort, help, helps them to start to uh, pick themselves up, but, well not pick them up, but the Lord is able to pick them up again um, where there was only despair. Um, and for me, have, having Having those words to speak to people requires great wisdom. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of prayer. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And sometimes when we're comfortable with someone, we're not thinking before we speak. Mm -hmm. I was really good friends with uh, one of the elders at the church. We sat on the church board together for several years and you know, we had developed a friendship and so, uh, and I knew his wife really well too. And so after my husband died, they lived in the same neighborhood and him and his wife would stop by and, and, and that kind of thing. Anyway, one day when he came by, not long after my husband died, I just wasn't having a good day. And so apparently he wasn't in agreement with my mood or something. I don't remember all the details. I just remember him saying, Terry, come on, just like snap out of it. You know, wow. like, come on, get it together. You, you can't continue this, you know. And I was really upset with him for a while. But after I processed it, I thought, you know, he meant well. He wasn't trying to hurt me. But he um, was invalidating your feelings. He was not. He was not. And yeah. yeah, there was a couple of times that same elder kind of scolded me when I was going yeah. through things. So it's it's important to be careful about what you say yeah, to people. And, and I think, J.D., you've got <laughs> Proverbs 12, 18. Why don't you read that? Because this speaks to what you're talking about. This is talking about words. Proverbs 18, this is going to be taken from the Amplified. There are those who speak rashly, mm -mm, like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Wow, that is so true. You know, there's just, uh, there, you flip a coin, <laughs> heads or tails, and hopefully if you're prayed up and you follow the route of being wise, you'll be there to put an arm around them and just say something that's kind, something that's compassionate, mm -hmm. empathize with what's going on at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so basically what that says to me is that 
careless words, it was like a spear to your mm -hmm. side. I mean, it's a wound. So we have to be so careful of what we say and we need to validate. You know what it means to validate is to make somebody understand that their feelings are appropriate. Mm -hmm. And what that elder did to you was invalidate you. It was like, that's enough. And I had somebody, when my mother died, somebody said to me, okay, you've mm -hmm. grieved enough, get over it. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna change anything by crying. And I can remember, I stuffed it all inside and I thought, okay, button up. And you know what happened? Six months afterwards, I was vacuuming the floor one day mm -hmm. and it was like a tidal wave, a tsunami hit me, knocked me off my feet. I mean, I'm on the floor just boohooing in a puddle. And grief will not be denied. And we need to never, ever feel like we can fix someone's feelings. You were just saying that. Yes. <laughs> she wants you to listen to her, mm -hmm. to be with her. Don't try to fix my feelings because if you, you're saying my feelings are wrong, we can't help what we feel. These are God-given emotions, and we can't say, get over it, it's been too long. Everybody goes at their own pace, and grief doesn't follow, uh, you know, there, there's things out there that talk about these various stages. It doesn't come all at the same time. I know people who have stiff-lipped it after the death of a spouse. I remember one lady said, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. And six months later, she was a wreck. Mm -hmm. So we can try to deny grief, but it's gonna come. Now, I will say, if we have a friend after six months to a year, if you see someone who's not making any advancement, that's complicated grief and it can become where it is a really chemical imbalance, a, a depression that they need maybe either medication or some serious counseling. But JD, let's talk about empathy and how we know grief support can be daunting. We all, none of us know what to say and sometimes just being there, as Sasha said, is what we need. But we need to be led by the Lord. Amen. You know, one, uh, I, in fact, I think you put these notes together, but I love this, you know, and I, I, as I was kind of going through, through this, boy, this just jumped out at me. Empathy is selfless. Mm -hmm. Yes. What a wonderful, what, that's exactly. fantastic. And basically, if you are, if you show empathy, you're, it's just, it's just, you're being sacrificial. Yeah. You are presenting yourself to them. And to me, how do you get there? You know what, I, um, I looked up the difference between sympathy and empathy. Um, and sympathy acknowledges something someone has gone through, but empathy says, I understand. Mm -hmm. And it's an experiential knowledge that you, you've been through something similar and you're more putting yourself in their place and yeah. understanding what they're going through. And so empathy is a totally different thing. And like now that I have experienced the loss of a spouse, when I hear of someone else who has lost a spouse, I get very emotional and I, my heart just goes out to them so much so that I have to go and reach out and let them know that I'm there for them because Amen. I know what they're going through. Amen. And I always say that if, if someone has lost a child, I can empathize in that I am empathetic. I, it, I take on people's feelings, but I cannot counsel and support them in the same manner as someone who has walked through that experience. Mm -hmm. I, I always try to match up uh, people with people. You know, you pray for people, you do what you can to help them, but you wanna match up somebody if you know two people that have gone through the same experience because they are able to understand better. What, we, oh, go ahead. I was gonna say, it's interesting that you, when you men mentioned about matching up people who have been through similar experiences, but to every Christian, there will be the experience of partaking in the sufferings of Christ 
empathizing with Christ's sufferings, knowing what, something of what Christ has been through by our own experiences as well, as, um, as, as we know that Christ suffered because he was resisting evil. And to resist evil brings suffering um, because the enemy is wroth with us. He's angry with us. And because of that, when we choose to follow in the footsteps of Christ to resist, we, we partake in his sufferings, the griefs that he went through. It says he was a, a man who was acquainted with grief mm. um, and carried our sorrows. Um, and so it, it just makes, makes my thoughts <laughs> go crazy because I, I just think of every, everyone in, in Christ's camp has the opportunity to have that experience. Um, you know something I love? You just <laughs> reminded me of this. I had a friend who she and her daughter were extremely close. I mean, they were like best mother and daughter, but best friends. And her daughter was very young, 40 when she died, had two young children. And my friend is such a strong Christian. She absolutely believed that the Lord was going to raise her daughter up. And the daughter went through a couple of years of, was really bad. But the hus her husband and, and then my, my, her daughter's husband and my friend just were convinced. And when her daughter died, it, it, she was absolutely blown away. Now, here's the point. She's not of our movement, our denomination. She's a Sunday keeper. The only thing that kept her from committing suicide, because she was close to it, the only thing that kept her from committing suicide was believing that her daughter was in heaven dancing with the Lord. And that, I mean, every time I talked to her, that was her conversation. And I asked someone, what do you think I ought to do? And they said, tell her the truth. Tell her where her daughter is. Explain to her. And I prayed about that. And the compassion of Jesus led me not to tell her because, you know, Jesus didn't, when, when he was teaching his disciples, he said, there's other things that you've got to learn, but you couldn't take it right now. Right. She couldn't take it right then. You know, sometimes we rush in and people will say things like, well, everything happens for a reason. God has allowed. People don't need to hear that right then. She didn't need, you know, by the way, she has read the book that I recently wrote, Spotless, and she has totally accepted the truth about the state of the dead and that her daughter is mm -hmm. waiting to be resurrected. But had I tried to go in, sometimes we want to beat people over the head with the truth. When they're not, just like Jesus told his disciples, you're not ready to hear it yet. You're not emotionally able to take this in. Mm -hmm. He didn't tell them all they were going to be martyred and killed and everything. It was unfolded a little at a time. Well, when you, when you garden, you don't just go to any spot in your, on your property and just start throwing the seeds just <laughs> randomly. Yeah. And just say, I hope, I hope this works out. You, you take that time, um, and that's what Jesus would always do to come close to those people who were hurting. A lot of his, dis his disciples didn't see the hurt. Um, they just saw, they don't believe what we believe, but Jesus met them where they were. There we he, go. He picked them up, and then he said, follow me. And there they were more go. desirous to follow him after he first tended to their, their needs yeah. um, and picked them up. But following along the line of what you said, the difference between sympathy is when you have, you know, you'll say, you know, our sympathies are with you. But empathy is when you're feeling something, and particularly if you've had experience, it, it really helps. So, J.D., there is a scripture I love yeah. that Paul tells us how God uses us to comfort others when we've been through it ourselves. This is one of those that probably everyone has written down, but if you don't, please write this down because this is special. And I, once again, I'm learning. If you live long enough, you have enough life experiences that I know that I can speak this from my heart. And that's taken from 2 Corinthians 1, 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 and 4. And it reads, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, 
and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Amen. How how sacrificial that is, you know, that let me help you, mm -hmm. you know, because I have a little understanding of what pain is all about. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had a wonderful conversation with a guy today, had a wonderful conversation with him yesterday. Yesterday it lasted 20 seconds. And uh, it was interesting because he was overwhelmed that somebody would answer the call and Jesus loves you. Mm. That was beyond his comprehension and I didn't realize I just, he hung up. And my, my heart's beating because did I do something wrong? Mm -hmm. Okay. So then he calls back today. I was very blessed today because we had probably 30 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just... Can you tell me what you said earlier, yesterday, mm -hmm. that Jesus loves me? Is that true? And I says, He loves you with an everlasting love. Amen. <laughs> so I'm, I'm anxious Monday morning <laughs> and to see where this is going to go. And by the way, if, you're, if you happen to be watching, know that God does love you yeah. with an everlasting love. He loves each one of us. But here he's saying that, hey, if you've got a problem, I'm there for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I have brothers and sisters around this world that are there for you. And I just, to me, it's comforting. And I just... I, I, I've mentioned this before, but I just I want to drive this home. Because we had an elder here, and he says, you know, I'm I, my best friend, the Holy Spirit. And I used to think, oh, boy, how can the Holy Spirit be your best friend? I just nearly thought with my minute mind that that's blasphemy. Guess who my best friend is today? <laughs> the Holy Spirit. And I'm finding that he's such a good friend that just about anything that I do or anywhere I go, I just call upon his name. Help me. Mm -hmm. And... Wow, the, the path is a lot smoother. Mm -hmm. And that's what he's saying right here. Yeah. He's saying, hey, I will give you the comfort because you understand comfort. Mm -hmm. You know what this scripture makes me think of is um, how God comforted me with nature. You brought out nature. Amen. And it's amazing how right before my husband died, it was just like three days before he died, we had moved to, uh, from a house to like a condominium in Florida. And God put me on a lake with beautiful palm trees. Mm. And, from the, and I had a patio, a screened in patio. And I could sit out on the patio and watch the sun go down. Mm. It faced the, uh, the west. So I could watch the sun go down. I could see the lake. There were birds. There was this big, mm. beautiful tree outside. I can remember sitting on that patio and just watching the sun go down, having frozen cherries, just feeling the comfort of the Lord, looking at pictures of my husband crying. But I thought, you know, where I had lived before, there was some beauty, but God really put me in a place where it was like he could minister to mm. me through nature. Mm. And so that's how this spoke to my heart, mm. the God of all comforts. He gave me a place that was so beautiful and such memories of him being there for me when my husband died. Amen, amen. Well, what I want to do is we're halfway through our program. And I love this story, and I'm so anxious for you to tell the big story here that uh, Terry has a, an amazing story about support. Let's begin on ways to support the grieving. And we've already said you want to have empathy, acknowledge their feelings, validate their, acknowledge their pain and validate their feelings. So we're going to go through these three steps, and then your friend encompassed all three. So then we'll go through that okay. as, and, and um, why don't you do the first one? Sure. Uh, so the first one is to be present mm -hmm. um, because often people need a companion or a shoulder to cry on. So <laughs> that's, that's where we back to Job's friends, yes. right? Yes. Their presence was comforting to them yeah. till he opened, they yeah. opened their yeah. mouths. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it's always a blessing when it's not just a, a blessing to the person who's receiving, but it's also a blessing to you um, because 
I keep going back to partaking in Christ's sufferings. Part of that was as he walked about and he saw these people, I'm pretty sure that's why he had his disciples with him because he said, look, look at what they're going through. I mean, mm -hmm. so, I think there's sometimes a coldness in the church um, and it's because people aren't partaking in the sufferings of, there of you others. Go. That's good. Um, but as soon as they do it, the barrier is broken down mm -hmm. and you realize, hey, they're not, they weren't distant from me, from the church because, you know, they just had this vendetta against God and I'm going to resist. But sometimes it's just, you haven't gone to them mm -hmm. to help them and to bring them in. That's why, sorry, not to belabor it, but that's why Jesus, when he spoke to Peter, he says, feed my sheep. Um, and he's wor before he was worried about all these other things, a place, power, but then he, as he started to feed his sheep, look at the amount of people that came into the fold. Amen. <laughs> that's good. That's yeah. good. So, yeah. so to show empathy, to acknowledge someone's pain, just your presence sometimes, just to hold somebody. I remember a lady who was 80, well, she was a couple of decades older than I, and she was just going through something, and I just grabbed her and put her head on my chair, and she just wept and wept and wept, and she said, I felt like I was being held by the Lord, oh. and we are His hands and His Amen. feet, Amen. so sometimes we don't have to say anything. So, Sasha, what's the second point? Uh, be a compassionate listener. Be slow to speak. As we see in James 1.19, it says, Understand this, my beloved brethren. Let every man be quick to hear, or a ready listener, and slow to speak. See? So, so how difficult is that? <laughs> you know, I, I have to tell you, I'm more like a man than a woman in that, <laughs> in that men are fixers. And usually when people, it took me many years, when someone would tell me their problem, I was immediately coming up with a solution. And I remember mm -hmm. we had a friend, Zosha was visiting from England and she was telling me of a problem in her family. And I immediately came up to say, well, have you looked at it this way? Have you done it? And she was like, are you taking my daughter's side? You know, she was offended because I was invalidating her feelings. I was too fast to speak. So what are some ways, if you're trying to be a good listener, how can you get people to talk to you? You can simply say, tell me about it. That is such a powerful opener for a conversation with somebody. And maybe they're not ready to talk. And if they're not ready to talk, just say, hey, whenever you're, when you'd like to visit, I'll be available. Amen and amen. So it's, it's something that we've got to be a compassionate listener and not do all the talking okay. ourselves. Okay, I'll look at the next one. We've got to, oh no, you do number three. I forgot, we can do number three. So we need to acknowledge their loss and we can do that by sharing memories of the loved one. Um, something we don't wanna say is I understand. Mm -hmm. Now, why not? Why don't because, because don't every people... situation is different. Amen. Every amen. relationship is different. I had a, a cousin that would say, I understand, Terry, and I, I never said it back to her, but I always think, no, you don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's true. We right. don't. If, uh, you know, I've lost all of my family, I don't have any blood relatives, my jetties, it. But when somebody loses a family member and they're feeling cut off, I can't say to them, I understand, because I don't know what their relationship mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. with that. I don't know where they're at mm -hmm. in their life. Every loss, even though we can empathize and we can say something to the, what I generally say is, I can imagine how you're mm -hmm. feeling. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, that resonates with me. I can imagine. Or sometimes if it's a mother that's lost a child, it's something that... I've not been through, I'll just say, I can only imagine, yes. or I can't imagine. And an extreme situation where you just cannot understand what the person is going through no. is, uh, back in Bermuda, there was um, uh, a brother, uh, Seventh-day Adventist brother, who uh, he lost his whole family in a plane crash. Mm. Um, and so I think it was what, like three children, yeah. his wife, his mother-in-law, um, and when when you see him go to the the site of the crash, what 
what words do you say? You can't, you can't say I understand because you definitely don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's just amazing how I, I, I know if he's watching, you know, I, I, I pray that everything, um, that he's received the comfort uh, that he, he's needed to sustain him, uh, the strength that he's needed, because I can't imagine what, what that's like. But it, you saw people outpouring love mm -hmm. sh surrounding him, mm -hmm. and that's what he needed in that moment. And I think it was such a great outpouring because that's the amount of support and comfort that he needed, and God was right there mm -hmm. to say, I have these people here to support you. Mm -hmm. uh, so like you said, to say I understand, sometimes it can come across as as hard, like you, 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 you try, you try, I know people do it um, innocently, mm -hmm. but at the same time, you're trying to fit yourself, it's like a round peg in a square, mm -hmm. yeah. square um, hole. You, you just can't comprehend what this person's personal experience is like. Something um, that I do like to say sometimes uh, is it really hurts my heart to see you hurting. Yeah. I do. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, you, you want to acknowledge their pain. You want to say, I can only imagine how difficult this is for you. In other words, you've got a right to feel awful. Mm -hmm. You've got a right to be going through this. Mm -hmm. And it makes my heart ache to see your heart ache. But, but, you know, if you don't know someone very well, you may not be able to say that to them. They may not take that as authentic, but you can always say, I can only imagine, or I can't imagine. Just remember, don't say I understand, because nobody understands somebody else, the, the circumstances of their life. You have to walk in that footstep. Now, we we'll talked, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. You know, following that, I think that it is important that somehow or the other you get the point, there is hope. Mm -hmm. You know, there is, you need to reassure them that there's nothing wrong with grieving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but we're, we're going to, and that's a major point, and I'm going to come back and let you do that one. I wanted you right now, Terry has a story, we're talking about being present with people mm -hmm. who are grieving, being a good listener, slow to speak, mm -hmm. and acknowledging their loss. Tell us the story of your dear friend when you lost your husband. Okay. Well, I'd like to preface the story by just saying that <clears throat> spending that time is important and it's so easy to just say, well, let me know if you need anything because I'm, I'm guilty of that myself. But I had a friend in Florida after my husband died, uh, I heard a knock on the door. This, this was maybe a week or two weeks later. I heard a knock on the door and I went and answered the door and there she was with a couple of bags in her hands. And Groceries? She just, yeah, food, there was food in there, but it wasn't cooked food. It wasn't your traditional make a pot of food and drop it off at the house and go on your way. She walked in and she said, Sister Terry, I'm gonna make you some soup. Mm -hmm. She said, but I haven't made the soup yet. I want you to tell me what you want in the soup. Mm -hmm. And so she went in my kitchen and we, we talked and she knew my husband too and she had loved him dearly. And she just spent time listening to me while she made that soup and asking me what I wanted in that soup. And it was just such a special time. And um, she it just, she put special. the time into it. She put the effort into it. And so I really appreciated that, it meant a lot. Yeah, mm -hmm. that, that is special. Mm -hmm. And one thing I wanna say as long as we're on this before we get to offering hope. When, if you're going to listen with somebody, please hear what I'm saying. And I hope I can, the thought just hit me. Sometimes people, let's say somebody's grieving over a divorce and they're just about their ex and they're mad or it's about a child that's left the, or something and they're mad at the child. It's not time and, and when somebody's going through grief, don't jump in and chime in on, yeah, they were this way or that way or something. Because what often happens is if we say something that is supporting all of these negative feelings, sometimes that grief goes away and the person is reconciled to that one. Then they're looking back on us, remembering all the bad things that we're saying. I had one lady tell me that she divorced her husband for an infidelity and somebody came into her and said, I don't blame you for 
he was a rascal. I've known he's been having affairs for the last 10 years. Mm. Wow. She was crushed mm. to find out. She only knew about one. But you know what? The Lord restored the relationship between she and her husband. But she could never felt like that lady could be her friend again because mm. she never told her. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to just pray. Yes. When you go to see somebody, if you don't know what to say, just be there. Just say, I don't, you can say that. Nobody knows what to say. But be careful. Remember, be slow to speak. Just ask the, door, the Lord to put a, a door, a, a lock at the door, no, a guard at the doorpost of your lips. All right, honey, you were making a very important point. Well, I mean, when you're down, well, that's a, that's a terrible place to be. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're in a pit and now you're looking up and you're wondering what else can go wrong. Boy, here again, the Lord's leading, he's guiding, and he, off, he, can, he has words of hope. Amen. That's the bottom line. And there's a couple of scriptures I'd like to read if we can Surely. do that. I mean, number one, I think that everybody goes through a period of grief, whether it's immediate or whether it's later, because, you know, there's that, it, it outruns you. It keeps up with you and then gets ahead mm -hmm. of you. I want to share Proverbs 12, 25. And the, the B part's what I really love. Anxiety in the heart of man causes depression. Ooh, boy, you know, here the heart's racing. You're trying to connect the dots. But it says then, but a good work makes it glad. Good word. Good word. Boy, just, mm -hmm. just having that right thing to say, maybe it's not very much. Maybe it's just say, I, I love you. You know, mm -hmm. sorry that you're in pain. And then Psalms 34. Psalms 34, 17 to 19. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears. Oh, I love Psalms. He always talking about the Lord hearing. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears and he delivers them out of their troubles. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as a contract that have a broken heart. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contract, contract spirit. Many are are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Amen. Boy, please remember that. The deliverer is there mm -hmm. and he's willing. And, and I think the point in offering hope, you're letting people know your grieving is normal. Mm -hmm. You know, this, this is the way it is. But letting them know that God's there for you, he yes. hears you. And I have to tell you, sometimes people, when they're grieving, they get mad at God. Now, if they're saying, you know, God took me, that might be a time I wouldn't tell my friend that her daughter wasn't dancing in heaven at the time. But if she'd been blaming God, I would have let her know God didn't take your child. It, you know, it's the devil who comes to steal, kill and destroy. But John 10 did. Jesus said, I've come to give a life and life abundant. But I want to just please make sure offering scriptures, the promises of the Lord are good. Like Isaiah 57 says that the righteous die and, and people wonder why. Uh, it's because the Lord's sparing them from evil. Well, that might be one that you can use, or maybe we'll, we'll get into some of these that can be used. But I have to tell you, I was speaking in England and it was an all several churches had come together. And one of the things I said is, if, if you know anything about my ministry, it started as a word ministry, praying the words back to the Lord, speaking God's, his promises back to him, speaking God's word over people's lives. But I was saying, be careful. And here's the example I used. I said, what if a mother has just watched her, or just found out that her husband and her child were killed in a car wreck and you come up from the church and say, all things work together for good mm. for those who love the Lord and called according to his purpose. That's Romans 8, 28. Well, what would you say? How would you feel if you've just lost like your friend and then you go up and say, all things work together for the good. Either you're going to be mad at God or you're ready to sock the person that said that to you. And what my point was, 
you know, God, there were no, there were no scripture verses in, in the separation. That's Romans 8, 28, but it continues. That's not the end of the sentence. It says, all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose. For whom God foreknew, he predestined to be made like his son, Jesus Christ. So your hope is that God is going to take your pain and your destiny to, to make you a little more like Christ. But what I'm saying is don't use scripture out of context. People will grab a scripture and they use it for someone and they make people end up that, you know, what, what scriptures do you like to use that bring comfort to people? Do you have one? Yeah, I think that in um, 1 Thessalonians yes. chapter 4, 16 through 18, just knowing that the Lord will descend from heaven and the dead in Christ will rise first. Amen. And then those of us who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. And then we're told to comfort one another with these words. And, and that's good comfort for a Christian. What if somebody, what if their spouse or their loved one wasn't a Christian? Mm -hmm. See, because I mean, I love right. that, that one because you can say, you know, I know you're hurting so much now. Thank God for the blessed hope that to know you'll be reunited and get to spend eternity with him. Mm -hmm. But what do you say to someone who's just not even sure that their, their loved one was, you know, and, and we're assuming it could be a divorce. It could be the grief could be maybe that they've been diagnosed with a, I, I think the main thing we've got to do is just let them know God loves you. He's afflicted with your afflictions. Mm -hmm. He's there, cry out to him. We don't have the answers. I think in those moments, um, people can feel hopeless because they've lost a loved one that they didn't know whether they were in the Lord or not. Mm -hmm. But uh, to come to them with, like you mentioned, to, we should come to them with encouragement to let them know that in spite of that, you still have hope and you were to live in that hope um, regardless of, and it's hard to find the words at times to, to convey that to someone. You're not, you're not telling them, you're not placing that person in heaven or, or hell. But at the same time, you know that that person feels within their heart that that person did not live a, a righteous life. And so you're coming to that person and presenting, well, you still have hope. It, it's, it's nothing worse than to think that someone else is going to be lost and you're going to be lost yourself um, because you refuse to surrender, to continue to walk with the Lord. It would be better for you to continue to walk with the Lord. And what if... You didn't know that, you may not know the in working of that person's heart. What if they're in the kingdom too? Mm -hmm. Amen. And so live with that hope. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> like the thief on the cross. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. So I think we've kind of touched on that. This could be, honey, did you have one that you wanted to add? No, I was just, uh, you were asking, uh, what is a scripture that you could claim? And I, yeah. I love Isaiah, Isaiah 4110. No. And he just says, you know, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you. And that's Amen. what I need to hear. I will strengthen you. Uh -huh. Yes, I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I'm not going to just leave you as an orphan. Amen. You know, I'm, I'm here. Uh -huh. Amen. And that goes back to the basis of everything. I'm available. Amen. You know, just be the person that the compassionate, loving person that you are. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lot of wisdom in that because we, it, we really don't need to focus on whether or not that person was saved or lost. Yeah. That God is the judge of all the earth. That's and, exactly and He right. knows the heart and He knows from the moment that person took their first breath until they took their last. And so thankfully we don't and have to make that call. He knows their last thoughts, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Okay, so number six is offer assistance. You had commented that sometimes we'll say, if you ever need anything or whatever you need, let me know. Right. Well, we can offer assistance. Let's talk about the ways, the practical ways to help the grieving. Uh, your friend came and cooked for you. That was right. so practical. I mean, we can do grocery shopping. Guys, everybody jump in. What can we do in a practical way to support I think the grieving? A practical place to start is start doing that in, in the regular day-to-day -day activities of your life so that when those tragic times come, 
you have something to, you have somewhere to pull from, oh, I should do this or mm -hmm. I should do that. But if you practice in your daily life not helping anybody, you're all for yourself, mm -hmm. then when those tragic times come and the Holy Spirit is saying, someone step in to help this person, you're not going to know what to do. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I uh, think one of the important things is to get them out of the house if they're true. willing. If they're willing, you can't force anyone, but sometimes just to get them out. And I mentioned nature, mm -hmm. you know, um, in Florida, we had a beautiful botanical garden just to take them for a walk out in a garden mm -hmm. or by the beach or whatever, the mountains, where, whatever the scenery is where you live, or take them out and get them something to eat mm -hmm. so they can have a different environment and mm -hmm. get out of the house. Well, on that, you can also help clean their yard. So when they go outside, they have a beautiful yard to look at. Or, and I know as a woman, having a messy house kind of clutters my brain and causes me stress. So maybe you can go and clean their house if they're not feeling up to yeah, it. And good. that could help to ease their stress a bit. There's a lot of things that we can do. And you know, it's, it's maybe a better way of, rather than saying, if I can do anything, let me know. You might just say, what can I do to help? You know, no, give me something. Mm -hmm. this, this had nothing to do with the death, but it had to do with caring. I know there's been a couple of times, we got the best neighbors in the world as far as I'm concerned. You know, Maybe. there's been a couple of times that we've been away for a period of time and we've come back and the yard's all mowed. Mm -hmm. nice. Come back, you know, the trees are trimmed. I mean, it's just stuff like that that just, uh, and r <laughs> we know our neighbors so well rather than say, well, I wonder who did this. We <laughs> know who did that, you know, yeah. our special neighbors. And, and, and our neighbors love fruit. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm probably not the best mower and all this kind of stuff, and they can outdo me, and they're saying, well, you know, you go rest. We'll take care of this. But I can bring them some grapes. I can bring them some uh, oranges. I can't, you know, the mm -hmm. things that I can do mm -hmm. and I'm willing to do. Yeah. And so you'd think that if you do it for the living, you'd do with those that are, their hearts breaking right yeah. now. Mm -hmm. And you don't have to go up and say, hey, <laughs> this is from Shelly. Right. Put it on the front door <laughs> yes. and the doorbell. I mean, you yeah. just get, yeah. get yourself out of the way. Yeah. Well, we've only got about three minutes left. So mm. let me just kind of fill this, you know, oh. the other things we can do is send cards, uh, send flowers. And, you know, find out if people like flowers, too. I've yeah. been sending a friend flowers. <laughs> she's, out, she's giving them to her daughter. She's not really a flower person. Um, but the most important thing I think that we can do is pray with them. Mm -hmm. Amen. And to stay in touch. You know, we are so good at when someone first loses a spouse or is going through a major upheaval, we're really good at staying in touch for a couple of weeks. Then the funeral's gone, life goes on, and it, it's expected to go on. I mean, we can't, uh, sometimes I get, I am an empath. I'm very empathetic about people's feelings. And I have to remember to be able to roll those over on the Lord. But life does go on, but you should, you know, put it in your phone to call them once a week or something. Stay in touch. Don't just leave them. And especially in the loss of a spouse, their whole life, their identity's been changed, you know, because they were a couple. Now they're single and it's, it's quite difficult. Mm -hmm. Thoughts on the prayers? Um, yeah, it's nothing like having someone come and pray with you. It kind of just lifts you up and you didn't even realize that, yes, that's what I needed. I needed someone to come Amen. and pray with me. Amen. It's a great encouragement. Amen. And you know that, and, and to develop that confidence um, in going to pray with that person, sometimes you might think, oh, what am I going to say? But the Holy Spirit will tell you what to say in that moment. And you'll notice that person just, you can sense that that person has a burden Amen. that is lifted. Amen. Amen. I want to share something with you that I find so fascinating. A dear friend of mine uh, who is originally from Hawaii was telling me that in Hawaii, a Seventh-day Adventist church there, um, you know, they've always been a church of outreach and they've done uh, uh, cooking programs and different things, but they opened up a grief recovery program in their church. The church is exploding. Not everybody will come to an evangelistic series. Not everybody from many different denominations or who doesn't know the Lord will come for all types of programs, but they'll come for grief recovery. 
So many people are grieving. I just want to encourage you, you can actually become a certified grief counselor. I know that they've got programs on. Maybe your church should think about this, do a grief recovery program. They're just doing it now. It's, it's causing so many people to come in and then they follow it up with, you know, maybe one evening that they're all having dinner and they have a little health, cook a healthy meal or they're doing Bible studies afterwards. But just know that God is the God of all comfort. He's the only way out of grief. Mm -hmm. I don't know how people do it who don't know the Lord. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I really don't. But we want you not only to be comforted to the Lord, but to learn how to be a good comforter. And that's what we're praying. We're all working on that. None of us have got it down pat yet. Darrell and Sasha Thomas, thank you for being here. Terry, thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. Honey, it's always fun with you. <laughs> Closing <laughs> thought? I just know I'm looking forward to the day when there is no more death. There amen. is no more death. Oh, pain. amen. No. Amen. No. The blessed hope. The blessed hope. Well, happy Sabbath. Our prayer for you is that the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is with you not only today, but always. God bless you. Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath.